Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. Welcome to another edition of Your Gardening Week. And the season is about to change, which is why today we're talking about frost and freeze, because for many of us, we're transitioning from summer into autumn. And if we live in a cold region, we're starting to think about that first frost that's going to appear. And for Southern Hemisphere folks, well, we're starting to transition from winter into spring. And in cold regions, we might be thinking about when the frost and freeze are going to end. So I'll be covering both of those topics today as we move forward and talk about our gardens and the season changing and that, how that affects how we garden and the plants that are in our garden. So hello to everybody. Hi to Heidi and Jay, our intrepid moderators. Everyone else that's checking in, Greenleaf Gardening, hello to you, finally here. Glad to see you here on a Monday as well. Jay points out that my area first frost date is October 1st to 10th, and my first frost is about that same time. The, the city of Colorado Springs that I live near has an October 5th average first frost date, but I'm about 800 feet in elevation higher than that, which means I can get my first frost maybe 10 days before that. Conceivably, historically, I could have my first frost in another week and a half or so. So I'm getting ready and I'm thinking about what's going to happen to my garden as we approach that point. So let's talk about the first aspect of the frost and freezes in our garden. And like we just talked about, it's helpful to know when your average frost date is. And so there's really two frost dates that are helpful to know, the one being in autumn and one being in spring. It's helpful to know when your average first frost is in autumn because you can kind of get an idea of when your season is going to end or at least start approaching the end. In spring, the last frost date is helpful because that's a good idea for you to determine when to start your seeds and when to put your plants outdoors. So of all the dates in our gardening calendar, those are two that I think are extremely helpful and that you should have committed to memory or at least have a good idea of when they are. And it's really easy. All you need to do is just do a search of first frost date and then put in the town or city where you live or last frost date and put in your town or city and you can expect not only the exact number to pop up but a number of sites that you can go to and learn more about those important dates so we'll be talking about that as we roll forward a number of you've been talking about being in florida like elysia and fighting the rain right now can't put anything in the plants for the bugs and so right now you in florida most of you are probably not even thinking about frost but even regions of florida can be exposed to frost so when we talk about frost what are we talking about well frost is defined as a layer of ice on the surface when the temperature gets to 32 degrees fahrenheit or zero degrees celsius when you go outside and you see a light covering of ice or that little white fluffy material that blows away or disappears as soon as the sun comes up that's frost the reason it's important for us to think about it as gardeners is because many of the plants that we're growing in our summer garden will be killed when the temperature hits freezing if they're not killed they're going to be severely damaged and they're not going to be producing any more of the flowers or the fruit that you're looking for so that's why this is an important date and why it's important to understand that when it comes it could spell the end of your gardening season but we can do things to protect our plants and avoid that damage and i'll be talking about that as we move forward as well amy says we are looking right now for our first home and garden when house hunting saturday any tips on community gardens 
there and she's talking to Heidi, of course, but uh, that's a great idea. Many of us, when we move into a new community and a new house, it takes us a while to get started, to figure out what's going on. One of the very first things I did when I moved into this new house three years ago was to check out if my area had a garden club and I jo joined the garden club. And so Amy, check out that as well. See if there's a garden club in your area because chances are there's going to be some experienced gardeners in that group and they can help you out as well. And hopefully Heidi has an answer as far as um, community gardens. But uh, getting involved right off the bat in a new community, in the gardening community, great idea. I really love that. So I'm glad you're looking into that. Lie in my garden, says Pacific Northwest, Did your, for you, the first frost is November 3rd. And it's helpful that you can remember that using your sister's birthday. I like that. And she's as cold as ice. That's, that's humorous. So it's one of those things that uh, however you choose to remember the day in particular, it's a good idea to at least know what the day happens to be. Uh, Heidi's asking, how close together are your hopes on your or hoops? I think is what it says. How close together are your hoops on your beds? Uh, I think that's what you're asking, Heidi. And so I'll talk more about this. This is actually my garden, and I'll be talking about the hoops in particular. But um, these are cattle panel hoops. And so the individual hoops, it's all connected, of course, but they, they're about eight inches apart, six to eight inches apart. But when I use the PVC hoops or the, the poly hoops, I'll usually place three of those in an eight foot bed. And they don't extend all the way to the end. So they're about three to three and a half feet apart is typically how far apart I put the hoops. And a lot of that depends on what I'm covering the hoops with. So if I'm just using the hoops during a summer growing period, and I'm covering with a landscape fabric or with netting, then I've got them three or three and a half feet apart. But when we start rolling into that time of year where I'm protecting my plants from the weather to include frost and wind, then I'll often put the hoops closer together. And so they may only be two and a half to three feet apart. I'll put an extra hoop in the bed. But that's one reason why I like using these cattle panels is because they're very sturdy, they're far enough apart so that I can get my hand in there and do all the work, but they're close enough together that it gives me a lot of space to connect whatever the material is that I'm putting on those hoops. So I hope that's what you were looking for with that question. Gail says, first frost day is September 15th and watching the extended forecast this year, it'll be around October 5th. So that's an excellent point. That's next on my list to start talking about. When we have an idea, Mal is coming in to say hello. When we have that idea of our average frost date, that's not a hard date. That's an average. Half the time it'll happen before then. Half the time it'll happen after that date. It's based on climatological data, typically over a period of at least 30 years. And the Weather Service publishes the dates based on those average conditions. So yes, October 5th, like mine, is the average first frost in autumn. But it doesn't mean that it's going to happen on that date. Or in this case, September 15th. It doesn't mean it's going to happen on that date. But start looking at the weather forecast. Great approach to this. Know your date and then start watching the weather. And I'm doing that. My weather is changing this week. Today and tomorrow, we're close to setting record high temperatures. And then at the end of the week, autumn hits for me. The temperatures are going to drop slightly below normal. But more importantly, my nighttime temperatures are going to start falling. And so when your nighttime temperatures start dropping below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, your plants are going to modify their growth pattern. So these plants that were growing for fruit, like the tomatoes and the peppers, when the nights start getting cooler, 
they're not going to be setting the fruit. They're not, they're not going to be in that growth mode anymore. They're going to start shutting down because they recognize that the end of the season is coming. When the temperatures, particularly at night, start cooling down, and then also the daytime temperatures start cooling down, you're probably not going to need to water as much because there's going to be less evaporation. The soil is going to hold on to that moisture better, which now means you run into the likelihood of overwatering if you stay with the same schedule that you may have been using during the heat of summer. So that frost date not only identifies when the weather changes, but it could also change or, or identify when some of your activities in the garden will start changing. And think about your harvests as well. I try to plan my gardening schedule with the idea that my beginning of October first frost date is going to be the end of my season. So I'm planning the harvests of all my squash, all of my peppers, my pumpkins, my tomatoes, all of those plants that will be killed by a frost, I want to make sure I have my harvest done before that point. And so now that you're, you're looking at a forecast with your general date in mind, you can be ahead of the game. You don't get caught by surprise. It may mean harvesting some of that a little bit earlier than you might originally plan for, but it's best to have your crops harvested and indoors before the frost hits because the frost can affect many of those fruits that we're trying to grow. The cool season plants, the root crops in particular, a lot of the brassicas, they can handle frost. They can handle some cool conditions. So you don't necessarily need to modify how you're gardening with those plants. It's mainly just those warm season plants that we really have to focus on. So be aware of that, identify your date, look at the forecast, and then start thinking about how you need to change what you're doing in your garden. And hopefully you'll be right on top of things. SC says, most garden plants are from tropical zones, not made for frost. Absolutely. And, and the tropical and subtropical plants, uh, like beans and peppers and squash and tomatoes, all the ones that I just listed, uh, yeah, those are the ones that can't handle any frost at all. Now, as we talk about the forecast and the temperatures, it's very important for you to know, and this is one of those things that took me years to, to even learn about, when the weather service is predicting your temperatures and when they measure the temperatures on a daily basis, they're measuring with special thermometers in special covered stations. But the important thing to understand is that that thermometer is typically mounted about two meters above the ground. And so when you see the forecast and when that historical data is published, that is the temperature about six feet above the surface. Well, for those of you who understand how hot air and cold air works, cold air sinks. So even though the temperature as measured by the weather service may show that it's going to be above freezing and that there is no threat of frost, it's possible that in your garden, especially in a low lying area, that the ground and the plants that are growing close to the ground could actually receive frost. On a day where officially it's above freezing, it could be at or below freezing at the soil surface where those plants are growing. And when I first started gardening, I couldn't understand that. I'd go out to the garden and see frost damage on my plants. And then I'd look at the paper and see what the temperature officially was. And officially the temperature was above freezing. And it took me a while to try to figure that out. How is it we can get frost damage on our plants when the temperature is above freezing? It's because of where physically the thermometer is when they measure the temperature and then report it and where your garden and the plants in your garden are physically placed. So be aware of that. Don't, don't 
push the limits. If, if you're looking at your, your forecast and the forecast is for a temperature of like 34 degrees, which is one degree Celsius, and you think, okay, great, that's above freezing, my plants are safe for another night. Maybe not. The air temperature might be 34 degrees Fahrenheit, but at ground level, it might be at or below freezing. So that's where we start thinking about protecting our plants and why I have these sturdy hoops on my beds. If you cover your plants with plastic is the ideal material to use when you're trying to protect your plants from the frost, and this holds true in both autumn and in spring, that plastic as an insulator really only makes about a two and a half degree Fahrenheit or one degree Celsius difference. It's not going to heat up your plants, but what it does is it traps the warm air in that bed around those plants. So when we have the cool air of night and everything is starting to get cold, that cold air is sinking down to the ground level. And at the ground level, that air may be close to freezing. But especially if you have raised beds and especially if you have plastic covering the raised bed, you can now keep the temperature underneath that plastic much warmer than that. And that's the approach I take for some of these, like this bed is cucumbers and peppers that are still producing. If I have a frost coming in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to throw plastic over this bed. And that extra two degrees Fahrenheit that the plastic provides, but more importantly, the three or four, maybe even five degrees of protection that it, it produces because it's holding this warm air from the daytime around those plants, that'll be enough to keep them alive and continue growing and possibly producing. If you're moving into a new area, I suggest you, you start monitoring your weather patterns. If you've been living in an area for a while, I suggest doing some analysis on your weather patterns. And if you don't really know and haven't been doing that, start asking the experienced gardeners in your area because everybody who lives in this area of Colorado knows that at the end of September or early October, we get that first frost on one day and then it warms back up again. We, our weather patterns are a roller coaster at this time of year and it's that dip maybe only one night that's getting that cold. But if we can protect our plants on that one night, then we've got another two weeks, maybe even three weeks left in our growing season. And so it's important for you to understand your local conditions because you may have similar conditions. You may have a gradual decline in your, your temperatures, not as sudden as we have. Yours might be more gradual. That's even better. By covering your plants and getting that extra protection at nighttime, you can easily extend your season a couple weeks. And so start thinking about that. And then in the spring, it's the opposite. You cover your plants early and get your beds warmed up and get some of those plants started in your beds so that after the last frost in spring, you've already got plants growing in your beds. So. Plant protection can buy you an extra two to three weeks on each end of the season if you plan for it and are looking at the forecast and understand that the temperatures that are reported may not be the actual temperatures that are in your garden. So something to think about along those lines. AJ has a barrel composter, it gets 160 degrees, so it's like a barrel heater. That's, that's actually a great method if you have a greenhouse and you've got space in the greenhouse, you can set up a compost pile in your greenhouse and it acts as a heater. Or you can actually have your compost pile and have beds right next to your compost pile. Cover your pile and your beds with the same plastic and absolutely, it's a barrel heater that, that will heat up all of the plants in that area. So that can be a great way to get free heating uh, especially during those shoulder seasons when we need just a couple extra 
degrees to keep our plants going for a little bit longer. And sometimes that's all we need is just that little bit extra time. Brian's saying, can you speak of the difference in the garden between frost and hard freeze? Excellent point. As you probably would expect, Brian, that's on my list. And so there are really three temperatures that we should be aware of in our garden. So the first being frost. And frost happens at freezing. Well, that's great. And protecting just that extra couple degrees can keep our plants above that critical damage point, and that's important. But of course, the next number you have to think about is the hard freeze. And so the hard freeze happens at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, that's minus two Celsius. With a hard freeze, we've gone past the frost point and ice can actually form. Now, of course, it depends on weather, on water vapor and any moisture. And so you can have a hard freeze temperature without any ice being present. But the reason this is an important number is because at 28 degrees, plants begin to have serious cellular damage. The plants, the warm weather plants, those subtropical plants are definitely going to be killed at that point. Even some of those cool season plants might start showing some cellular damage. At 28 degrees, covering with plastic will buy you a couple extra degrees, but it may still be low, may be below freezing. And it's really hard to keep plants alive when the temperature drops to that point. And the third is what's actually called a killing frost even though it's well below the frost point. And that's at 24 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus 4.4 Celsius. And so at that temperature, even those cool season plants that were growing, those beets and that Swiss chard and that spinach, they can start getting some serious damage when the temperature gets that low. And so as you look at your forecast, and as I said earlier, use the forecast and the changing weather in determining what you're going to do in the garden, look at those three temperatures in particular. As it approaches freezing, the frost point, you can protect your plants and keep many of them alive. As it gets to that hard freeze point, the 28 degrees Fahrenheit, now you start thinking about garden cleanup because so many of your plants are going to be dead but you can also be thinking about protecting some of those cool season plants that can handle temperatures around freezing. And then when it gets to that killing frost point of 24 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the point that I usually say I'm done. Last year, actually two years ago, and, and I talked about this in one of my videos two years ago. Two years ago, we didn't have that progression for me here in my garden we didn't have a frost and we didn't have a hard freeze. We went from above freezing to below the killing frost point. We went from temperatures that were in the, the high 30s, uh, roughly about three degrees Celsius. And overnight, the temperatures dropped down to 18 degrees Fahrenheit which is about minus eight degrees Celsius. Overnight, we had a 20 degree, more than a 20 degree temperature change. And so sometimes you can plan for the gradual decrease. You're going to protect your plants. You're going to do what you can. But two years ago, I saw that forecast. I made no attempt to cover my plants with plastic. I made no attempt to try to extend my growing season. Because when it's that cold, there isn't a lot you can do unless you have that supplemental heat, like you're growing in a greenhouse that has heat or you've got that compost pile that's producing heat. I just accepted my season was going to be over literally overnight. I harvested everything that I could harvest before that night came. And then after the words, I just cleaned up my garden because the plants were dead. So that's why I say it's important that you understand your weather patterns, your historical patterns, and then the day-to-day -day 
and seven to 10 day forecast so you can plan your activities uh, as those days approach. So, and it's, it's very disheartening that I was able or not able to extend my season by some of those measures that I normally take, but that happens sometimes. This year, things are looking great. We haven't had, knock on wood, a frost. We're not forecast to have one for the foreseeable future, but the days are changing. So I'm keeping a good eye on what's going to be happening in the weeks ahead. Greenleaf Gardening says, pretty please shout out. I need 50 subs to live stream like you. Should I stop saying I want to shout out? So shout out to Greenleaf Gardening and uh, it, it's okay. I hope you can get 50 subs and you can start doing live streams. It's, it's a lot of fun, but uh, uh, don't worry about it. It's going to happen. Have some patience. That's the thing about subscribers when you have a, a YouTube channel is, is they'll find you produce the good material and they'll find you and the numbers will come up and then you can start doing something like the live chat. Sprig Farms finally made it to the live chat as well and now to replay. Hello from Southern Louisiana. Well, nice to see you here. Yeah, my son is in Hammond. So uh, they're, they've got a much longer season. I've been talking to him about starting a garden. He wants to do a garden in his new house next year. And of course, the conditions in Louisiana are much different from the conditions here in Colorado. But even in Louisiana, the frost threatens and occasionally there's snow. And so in those warmer areas around the world, in the southern United States in particular, it gives you good opportunity. My brother lives in Arizona. We have a lot of you in Florida. Sometimes that little bit of protection, that little bit of plastic cover over your plants is all you need for those few days you have where the temperatures are going to, to drop close to that frost point. Rarely do you get the hard freeze for many of you in those regions, but it's possible. Just be aware that, that there are those things you can do to keep your plants growing and everything is going to be wonderful. AJ says, I grow my cannabis, so I got to grow or get to grow year round. This year is going to be a challenge. So uh, I know you're talking earlier about being in warm conditions, but that's another one of those plants that can't handle any cold. And so you've got to be ready with the, the, the protection as needed if you start having some days that start dropping into uh, the low, low temperatures that some of us dread. Hi, Aaron. I didn't see the list of small channels from last week on the YouTube link. I thought it was going to be posted, but maybe I misunderstood. So no, it is going to be posted. And my daughter is helping me with that because we had a whole bunch of, of people afterwards in the replay that listed their channel. And so it's taking longer than we expected to actually look at each of the channels and then put a link to each of the channels because there's actually a lot of those channels. So it is coming and it should come out this week with uh, a, a link, a list of links. I, I want it to be more than just a list of the channels. I want a, a link to each of those channels. And that's kind of what's taking a little bit extra time. Uh, it was my granddaughter's birthday over the weekend. And so that kind of slowed things down because we were busy with some birthday activities. So yes, I did say last week that I was going to do it and it is going to be done. Um, it just was more work than we expected. So it's taking a little bit longer than expected, but it's coming. It's coming. TJ the Hawk says, any plans to use the new greenhouse to protect some of your warmer crops in the coming months? Absolutely. And so um, I, I haven't grown a lot in my greenhouse back here. This is the first year I've been experimenting, but I've got peppers growing in the greenhouse. I've got tomatoes growing in the greenhouse. And I did, I'm doing kind of an experiment with some tomatillos where I planted them late in the greenhouse uh, to see how the growth works as we move into these colder months. And so depending on how that all turns out, and I may or may not do a video on that. I don't have a specific video planned right now with those plants, but it, I may end up doing uh, a video where I, I specifically talk about that as far as using the greenhouse uh, for those plants. Now, the other thing I'm doing or planning to do at least is to do some overwintering of some pepper plants and some of the tomato plants. So I have some tomato plants in pots outside the greenhouse and I'm planning on moving them inside the greenhouse. 
and uh, I'll also I'm planning on potting up some pepper plants and moving them into the greenhouse. So that kind of ties in with what you're talking about. If you have plants in pots, and I've been debating on uh, my blueberry plants, I've got blueberries in pots, and I'm about 60 to 70 percent decided that I'm going to move those blueberry pots into the greenhouse for extra protection. And so my greenhouse still gets cold, but it's going to be protected and a little bit warmer than the outside conditions. So yes, I do have plans to do that. And depending on how it works out and what I find out, um, I may or may not do a, a video on that. I'll probably talk about it in the live stream. There's a lot of stuff I talk about in the live stream that I don't make videos about. And so I anticipate that I'll be talking about the greenhouse and what I'm finding out about it in a future live stream, uh, whether we have a video about it or not. So yeah, keep asking those questions because that is something that, that I am uh, thinking of. And by you asking questions, it helps prompt me to figure out what I'm going to do with that. Uh, Patty, hello, I'll soon be adding, um, looks like leaves to your mold pile. The leaves in the pile are a year and a half age. Should I just mix the new leaves in with the old or harvest first? And thank you, Gardener Scott, you're very welcome. So when you do a, a mold pile, leaf mold, where you're, you're doing the, the leaves, you can approach it either way. Now in a compost pile, if you're doing hot compost, the bacteria, the thermophilic bacteria that generates all that heat, they need that warm environment and they, they produce the heat and break down the organic matter into compost. And if you add new material to your compost pile, it, it breaks up that pattern and they basically have to start all over again with the mesophilic bacteria and then they start warming it up and then the thermophilic bacteria gets in. So you can actually disrupt your compost making by adding new material after it has already started heating up. That's not the case with the leaf mold. Leaf mold is broken down primarily by the fungi that are breaking apart the leaves and, and it's a different type of decomposition. It's a different organism that's breaking apart the leaves and so in a leaf mold pile that's a year and a half old you probably have some very good fungal activity so now by adding new leaves you might be able to actually hasten the breakdown of the new leaves because you have all of that activity already in place and so it, it's different than a compost pile and a lot of it depends on when you're planning on using it. If you have a use for the leaf mold right now, go ahead and harvest what you have right now and then start over again. Uh, or yeah, go ahead and add some more leaves to that, that pile and then wait till the springtime and you may get quicker breakdown of some of those leaves. They're not all going to break down. It still takes a long time for leaves to break down, but it might be a little bit faster adding them to uh, an older established pile. So thanks, that's an interesting question. And not a bad idea. And it, it's basically like using the old, year and a half old leaf mold as an inoculant, if you will, for the new stuff. It, it's taking all the, the those organisms that are already there and just putting them right into the leaves rather than waiting for that to occur naturally, which, which can take uh, a longer period of time. But uh, it, it all depends how fast you want it to break down and whether you're planning to use it. Because if, you, if you're planning on using the leaf mold within the next six months, well, by adding the new stuff, it, it makes it harder because you're going to have to take out the new stuff to use the old stuff. So uh, maybe half and half. Think about how you want to approach it. And that might be a, a good way to, to think about it. So, uh, so Jay is saying, in the garden with Eli and Kate is here. I haven't seen you check in. Oh, there you go. Hi, in the garden with Eli and Kate, one of my favorite small gardening channels, as I talked about last week, and their work schedule doesn't allow them to be here. But I'm, I'm guessing that because of the Queen's funeral happening today, that you have the day off. And so uh, it, 
it's on all of our TV channels here in the States. It, it really is a big deal. I, I talked about it last week briefly about here, even in the States, the Queen's funeral is, is really a big deal. So uh, it, it, it took the Queen's funeral to have Eli and Kate here with us, but I'm glad that you are, and I'm glad that you're participating. So thanks so much for that. And there's the link as Jay always produces. So thank you, Jay, for being on top of things. AJ's wondering, uh, is it best to keep everything separate until you make a compost pile? Never mix new, or it's best, never mix new with old while cooking. Yeah, there you go. That's what we were just talking about. And and I that's if you want a hot pile. Now, I have the video where I talk about lazy composting, where you just throw things in, and that's why lazy composting or a cold pile or cool composting takes so long. Because every time you add new material to it, it slows down the whole process. So AJ's uh, exactly right, and that's what we were talking about. So uh, yeah, public holiday in the UK. So glad to have you here. Always nice to see you as well. Um, okay, and so yeah, Gail is, is watching it, and Urban Chicken Mama is watching that. And so uh, yeah, it, and I was watching it before coming up here as well. So um, it, you know, it's a, it's a sad time. But definitely, it's 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 a a worldwide event that many of us are are, are aware of and and taking part of in our own way. Leanne is asking: My winter squash plant started out great and developed fruit, but de developed a leaf disease with yellow splotches, and the plants died. Sprayed copper fungicide, didn't work. What happened? <clears throat> and so, yeah, there are lots of things uh, that could be happening. Uh, identifying the specific disease is helpful to find out whether it's in your soil or not and will repeat next year. My squash plants are, are, are starting to, um, to have a few issues. That's normal as the plants get older. As far as the yellow splotches, um, I'm not sure exactly what that could be because there are, are a number of diseases. And so understanding the the type of diseases that our plants have and then if it happens identifying that disease on our plant can really help answer the question how did it happen and how do you prevent it there are some diseases that are brought in by insects and so you'll have an insect like a squash bug that starts with your starts eating your plant and it causes a disease to, to infect your plant. There are others that are brought in uh, on the wind. So if your neighbor's garden has a disease, the spores for a fungal disease can blow in the wind and land on your leaves and cause that to, to be a problem. It could be in the soil. If it's, if it's a disease that's present in your soil, that's why I'm a big advocate of mulch. If you if it rains or you water and the spores that are in the soil bounce onto the leaves, that can cause a fungal disease to develop. There are bacterial diseases that follow the same basic pattern. So it's 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 helpful to identify specifically what those yellow splotches are if you can, to be able to identify where the disease came from, and if it's something that you can fix. So. So it might not be a fungal disease. It could be a bacterial disease. And so while uh, a copper fungicide will work if it's a fungal disease, the copper won't work if it's a bacterial disease. And that's why it's important to, to identify and understand just exactly what it might be that, that, that's causing the particular issue. And then there are some that uh, are just common and, and don't necessarily cause problems. You see that with blight on uh, tomato plants. Early blight and late blight are two different diseases, very similar. Early blight in particular can be controlled pretty effectively if you recognize it and prune off those leaves and, and the plant will continue to grow. By the time late blight sets in, often that's the end of a tomato plant and, and your season is over at that point. So uh, it, it all depends. I can't give you a specific answer of what caused that, without knowing exactly what kind of disease it was and which category it falls into. So I suggest you, you do a little bit of research and you and do a search. You may have already done this, but do a search of 
um, yellow splotches on squash plant. And you'll probably see a whole bunch of images pop up and then you just match your image with whatever it shows up and that should help you uh, with your detective work to try to figure out what's going on. Shandy's Garden saying with a plastic greenhouse for the first time wondering what the best flooring would be to preserve more of the daytime heat. Still have the carpet I use to kill the grass. And so uh, you want, there are two really good materials that can hold and retain heat. One being water and the other being stone. So in my greenhouse, I use brick as a walkway from door to door and the brick will absorb the heat during the day and then release it slowly in the cool evening. If you make sure that your your ground in the greenhouse is watered, moist soil retains heat much better than dry soil. And so going into the evening, if the, the soil in your greenhouse is moist, it actually helps retain heat better. And then when I build my, my plant bench underneath the bench, I'm going to have gravel for this, the same reason as I have the, the brick pathway. The gravel, that rock, will, will hold the heat and then slowly release it into the evening. So think about those kind of materials. Um, metal and wood really don't work in a greenhouse for that purpose. And most of our greenhouses are made out of either wood or metal. And so you need to have that other material that you bring in rock and then start thinking about a, a water source as well to help keep it up. I've, I've got some uh, rain barrels filled with water achieving the same thing in my greenhouse. That water absorbs the heat during the day and releases it at night and that helps ensure that, that the, the air at least is warmer in the greenhouse than it is uh, outside the greenhouse. And, and for me, at least this time of year, and for those of you that have uh, greenhouses in particular, it, it's those few extra degrees that we're talking about. We talked earlier about the plastic over a hoop, adding that extra protection. That's what a greenhouse is doing during the same period. But greenhouses tend to be better insulated so you can get more protection on your plants if you can provide that heat source. And so, yeah, start thinking about rock and brick and those kind of things. And you might actually uh, see some good results uh, as you move forward protecting your plants. So Urban Chicken Mama says, I burned a bunch of diseased squash plants last week. I was tired of fighting it. Still have others growing. Sorry to hear that. But yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, especially in a lazy composting pile, you shouldn't put your diseased plants because even if it's a, a disease that isn't in the soil, by taking your diseased plants and putting it into your compost pile, you may be introducing that disease to your garden next year when you use your compost in your garden beds. Uh, either as a mulch or amended into the soil. So, so burning, if you can, we're still, we still have lots of burn restrictions here in this part of the country. And so we're actually not allowed to burn things, but if you can burn, burning is a great way to get rid of diseased plants. I don't normally bag things up and throw them in the trash, but this is one of those instances where bagging up diseased plants and throwing them out in the trash is one way to get them out of your garden because you really do want them out of your garden so that you don't have the problem in the future and, and that's really what we're looking for redhead co i'm interested to hear more about potting up peppers from the garden to bring in this was a great pepper year in my boulder community garden plot getting a head start for next year would be nice and so the idea is is to overwinter your pepper plants and keep them close to dormant. So you don't want them exposed to, to the freezing conditions, but by potting up your pepper plants, and you can just use a, a basic potting mix. It doesn't need to be anything fancy, but you do a really hard pruning on the pepper plant. You're, you're cutting back the branches. You're cutting off most of the leaves. You're, you're not after photosynthesis to keep the plant growing. You're after just a few leaves and a more compact plant 
that the roots will be able to sustain and it'll stay alive if you move it into a cool room of your house. If you have an area that's around 50 degrees, 10 degrees Celsius, give or take a little bit, that's really an ideal point where the plant is not actively growing, but it's not so cold that it's going to kill it. And then you just keep the soil moist, you keep the plant alive, and then in the spring, you put it right back into your garden and it could start taking up from where it left off. And so that's the basic idea behind overwintering your peppers. I'll be able to do some of that in my greenhouse, but here in Colorado, even our greenhouses get below freezing unless we have that supplemental heat, usually electrical, to keep it above freezing. And for many of us, uh, it, it's just not worth it. And so we don't take that effort. We just accept that the season is over at that point. So um, my plan is to show how to overwinter a pepper, but based on how I make videos, I'll be showing digging it up, potting it up, moving it indoors, but then I'll also be showing how to take care of it over the winter and then repotting it in the spring. So my overwintering pepper video as I have it planned right now is not going to come out till next year. So I know it doesn't help you out much, but um, check out, I think Pepper Geek. I mentioned Pepper Geek last week. That's a channel I like. And I think he's got some videos on overwintering peppers and that might be a, a good way to get started with it. Uh, okay, so um, Greg says, speaking of composting diseased plants, if you do lazy composting and happen to add diseased plants, to, oh, is there an amount of time you can let that compost sit before you use it to make it safe? Um, there you go. I was touching on that, but I didn't answer that part of it. Uh, so uh, it depends on the disease, but there are many disease bacteria and spores that can last years in the soil. And so the cold composting method is not going to kill that bacteria or those fungal spores. And so they're probably still going to be viable. And as far as a time period, it could be years. So if you want to, to compost diseased material, you really need a hot compost pile. You, you need a pile that's going to get up above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 60 Celsius, for a sustained period of time. That will be enough to kill the bacteria and the spores, and then you can use it like you would any other compost. It's finished compost. Um, but, but no, to your question specifically, composting diseased plants in the lazy compost method is not going to make that compost safe, um, really at all. Unless you were to leave it sitting out for four, five, six, seven years, that's usually enough time to kill some of those organisms. But that kind of defeats the point of making compost if you're just going to have it sitting for that amount of time. So it, I, just don't compost the diseased material or compost diseased material in a hot pile. And either of those methods will allow you to use the compost right away. And that's, that's really the, the main consideration, I think. Gail says, I have one full-size birdhouse gourd and spaghetti squash. They aren't ready to pick, but frost is coming. Can I pick them before frost and will they continue to ripen? So, so they will continue to ripen to a certain degree. They're not like tomatoes where they have that release of the ethylene gas and they become nice and ripe again. There will be some residual ripening of, those, of the gourds and squashes. Uh, and so wait as long as possible as you can. And then uh, a method, and, and I've done this before with tomato plants, but you could do it with any other fruiting plant. You can pull the whole plant out of the ground and then hang it upside down. And basically all the energy that's in the, the, the stems and the leaves and the roots can continue to flow into that fruit until the stems and the leaves and the roots dry out. And so that's another way that I've used to, to continue ripening tomatoes is just to pull up the whole plant, hang it upside down, leave the fruit on the plant, and then you get a couple extra days of plant energy going into that fruit. So uh, yeah, it, it's better to pick them under ripe and hope that they ripen a little bit 
than to leave them on the plant and wait for that frost and freeze to hit and actually damage the fruit and soften it maybe even to the point that you, you can't really even eat it anymore. Um, okay, growing back to basics, what are you doing with chicken poo this season? Can I top off beds now? So yeah, so chicken manure is actually a pretty good way to top off your beds at the end of the season. I don't recommend using fresh manure on actively growing plants or on plants uh, that you're going to be harvesting soon because of those E. coli and salmonella issues that chicken manure can have. But if the bed is done for the year and you're getting ready to, to, to put it to bed for winter, yeah, top dressing with a manure is fine. I'm planning on doing that with alpaca manure on a lot of my beds this year. And it's, it's the same idea. Last year, I used alpaca manure and chick manure on my fruit bush beds at the end of the season. I just spread it on top of the mulch that was already in place and then just let it decompose, break down, leach into the soil over the course of winter and spring. Um, so uh, easy, easy way to amend the soil. Uh, I, I would suggest with chicken manure on a bed that's not actively growing, put the chicken manure down and then also put down a mulch of some type that a, an organic mulch like like straw or crushed leaves because they will also break down but they'll, they'll also help keep the chicken manure moist enough that it will it will break down faster and stay warmer so that it breaks down faster until cold freezing conditions might might hit so um, yeah definitely consider doing something like that um mkin is asking can any plants be stored as bare roots and regrow next year. There are some, you can you can do plants um, like asparagus, for instance, and strawberries that we buy as bare root. It's, it's a little more difficult because you have to make sure that, that you don't kill the roots while you're storing them. Uh, and then of course, there are uh, a number of fall flowering bulbs uh, that you really should be digging up and storing and then planting again in the spring. So I would say there, there's more flowers that fall into the category of something that you can store. But most of our vegetable garden plants, um, it, it's not as easy. You could, you could harvest carrots and beets and those kind of root crops and then plant them again next year for the purpose of growing seeds because those are biennial plants and they usually don't produce flower stalks and seeds until their second season. So that's an option is to grow root crops and then harvest some of them for the intent of growing again the next year for seed. But uh, no, generally there, there aren't many things that we're growing that we would save as a bare root. Uh, if, if you wanna save something like we were talking about with the pepper, pot it up and then save it as a plant to re-put or repot or replant into the ground next year. Ryan says, I did make a video, good for you, but have a hard time on the editing end. Maybe this winter, I do have a garden tour from the last two years. And so, yeah, we're talking about it last week, making videos, getting those videos up. Don't worry too much about the editing, Brian. Um, just some basic editing that would make you happy is really all you need to do. And like I said last week, do it. Then you'll see what's, what's needed for it. And then make another video and practice more editing. And that's how you get good at it is you just keep doing and keep making more and keep trying new things and eventually you'll get better. Don't try not to make your first one like that. Um, so good that it takes too, so long to actually make it happen. Urban chicken mama worms need grit just like chickens. I put eggshells in my compost bins yesterday. The worms were all over it. Eggshells and coffee grounds are both excellent worm grit. Absolutely. In fact, I think in the, um, the video I did this weekend where I was talking about ways of preserving, I think there's one of the shots. If you look really closely in the background, you can see eggshells on my counter. And the reason I've got eggshells on my counter is for my worms. Uh, you're exactly right. Worms have a gizzard. Earthworms have a gizzard just like chickens have a gizzard. And that's how they digest their food is, is it goes into the gizzard and then gets crushed up. And they do that with grit. And 
Earthworms also uh, use a lot of calcium, like most living organisms, and so the eggshells are one way to provide, crushed eggshells are one way to get the grit for the earthworms and also produce some of the calcium in the soil that they can benefit from. So good for you. Yeah, good suggestion, great idea. And uh, I do the same thing. I, I, I save some of my eggshells for my worms as well. And the, and the eggshells I add to my compost pile, I do it for the, the native earthworms. Eggshells in general are not really adding calcium to our garden soil. It's, it's not a calcium that's usable by the plants. It takes a long time to break down. And unless you have acidic soil, it's gonna take a really long time to break down. But if you can put crushed eggshells into your compost pile, when the earthworms come in and start eating the organic matter, there's some eggshells already for them. And I kind of do it for my earthworms. Not really sure if it does much good outside, but I continue to do it. So why not? Uh, thanks, Che. There's the link to that best ways to preserve your harvest video. 13 ways that you can you can preserve your food and uh and and so uh that, that's actually on my list as well so thank you for reminding me about to talk about that that as i i've mentioned earlier you modify how you're going to to do your gardening as the the first frost or the last frost approaches well especially if you have a big harvest that's coming but it's not here yet i encourage that you think about preservation of it as part of your garden activity. And so like we I've talked about in that video and we did a live stream a few weeks back where we were talking about preserving your harvest, be ready for it. Because I've got a ton of tomatoes right now. I'm gonna be freeze drying most of them this week, but it takes time to plan for some of these preservation methods that we're going to be using, especially if you're canning tomatoes or if you're going to be dehydrating, there's some prep work involved with that. And so that's another reason to look at the forecast and try to figure out when the season is going to be ending so that you can build in that, that preservation time into your normal gardening activities because it, it can take a good amount of time. So think about that as well. And yeah, that video shows lots of options for choosing how to preserve your harvest build it into your plan. If you haven't done food preservation with your garden harvest, do it this year. Start. You can start with something easy like drying herbs, but it's not really that hard to can tomatoes. Uh, and it's a piece of cake to dehydrate a lot of those things that we're growing as well. So uh, add that to your list of things to learn more about and to actually start doing because uh, I think you'll enjoy it. You can easily be hooked on that as, as you move forward. Uh, Bohemian Herbology is saying, going to try and make a basil infused vinegar today. That's one of the things I talked about was infusion. So good for you. Uh, basil vinegar is actually real. And like I said in the video, I love making vinaigrettes with my infused oils and vinegars. So uh, basil infused vinegar sounds wonderful. I like that idea. That's really good. Jay Link, prepping some beds for next year, adding a usual mix of soil, compost, and leaves. Can I add cedar sawdust too? Oh, absolutely. Now the cedar, um, because uh, like most softwoods, most conifers, they're going to, the, the, the wood, the sawdust is going to take longer to break down than a hardwood. But yeah, absolutely do it. Mix it in pretty well. The, the, biggest, the big issue when you add sawdust is if you put it like as a layer and just pour it on, it can clump and actually be, be create an impermeable layer in your soil so that water and air can't get in. So uh, I, I, I've got bags of, com, uh, of sawdust and I add them to my beds on a regular basis in fall as I amend them as well. So uh, yeah, absolutely, you can add sawdust. Just be aware that cedar sawdust as opposed to something like oak sawdust, it, we're not talking a great amount of time, but it, it does take a little bit longer to break down. But those soil organisms will get to work on it right away primarily the fungi is what's going to break down the the woody material like a sawdust and so uh this this last year and i've talked about it a couple of times 
But uh, when I saw the m mushrooms growing in my hugo culture beds, and when I saw mushrooms growing in my new um, metal beds that are back here, I was happy because mushrooms are a sign that you've got some good fungal activity and you need that fungi to break down those woody materials. And so if you're adding sawdust to your beds and you see mushrooms growing, that's a good sign. That's showing that that, break, that that sawdust is being broken down and that your soil is being enriched. So uh, yeah, good way to, to reuse um, for woodworkers in particular. Uh, good, good way to reuse some of that material in your garden. Rachel says that preserving time is time consuming, but I found it as rewarding as gardening and it will take you into the fall. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I say you, you'll get hooked if, if you start doing preserving. And uh, and so uh, I, I made some pickles and I, I talked about it a couple weeks ago, I think, when I was talking about um, preserving and some of the recipes. And I used a double brining recipe for the the pickles that I made uh, the most recent batch and the feedback is the best pickles I've ever made well it's hard to not make it again if everybody says they're the best that they've ever had and that's why you get hooked as you you find a preservation method you like and then you follow a recipe that works and now it becomes part of your your normal gardening activities every year you do the same thing that's, uh, that's why a couple weeks ago I made my peach jelly because the Palisade peaches from Palisade, Colorado are incredible. And so this time of year, that's what I do is I get my, my Palisade peaches and it is time consuming, but I set aside a day to do it. And let's see, this year I made, um, I think I did 30 jars of peach jelly. So... Um, I have plenty of jelly. I've already given a whole bunch away. I'll be giving a lot more away, but that's one of the things that I like to do because I like preservation. I'm hooked on it. It's fun. And it's a great way to work into the fall, especially if you can preserve your own garden harvest. What could be better than that? So absolutely wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Melissa says, I've been avidly canning this year and it's been a lifesaver. There you go. Zucchini pineapple is amazing. And when you have tons of zucchini, you run out of things to do with them. Absolutely. So preserve it. Um, zucchini pickles. Um, I actually have a, a video, I believe, on making zucchini pickles. And uh, I've, I've got videos on my uh, pickled beets, of course, my fermented beets. And I'm planning a video. I'm planning a big harvest this week of my Swiss chard. And then I'll be doing a video on how to make Swiss chard pickles. And so, yeah, there's just so many fun things you can do between canning and fermenting and pickling and dehydrating and freeze drying all those ways that you can reuse the harvest it, it's awesome and definitely something i think people should start thinking about uh, urban chicken mama canned and preserved all weekend sell some of my canning along with my eggs that's a nice way to to make some money my clients also get gifts i have enough hot sauce for an army that's fantastic that's where i was last year with some of my garlic powder. I made a ton of garlic powder. This year I'm planning on um, fermenting and pickling a lot of the garlic. Uh, in addition to freeze drying, you'll be seeing some of my freeze drying videos because I'm really looking forward to using my new freeze, new freeze dryer and, and doing some fun ways to, to, to use it and preserve the food. Uh, you know, what, what, a few things are better than that. Heidi says, this is the first year I started to can my tomatoes. Awesome. Got a couple ball canning books first though. Yeah, the the ball blue book and the complete guide to home preserving uh, are the two that I have and they're both ball books and that's a great way to start. Not only do they tell you how to can and show you how to can, but all those recipes. Um, I've tried a whole bunch of the recipes in those books over the years and I can't think of one that I didn't like. There's some that I've modified because maybe the spices they used were a little bit different than the ones I had on hand. But yeah, the ball books, the ball canning books are a great way to get started and definitely a great way to, to learn how to do it. Digging for health, just got a freeze dryer. Can't wait to start freeze drying everything. That's exactly the way I look at it. And, and so I, I've got mine just set up and we'll be doing the test and freeze drying as well here real soon. So 
Uh, I was actually surprised at how many of you have freeze dryers. When I did that unboxing of the freeze dryer uh, last week, uh, I was I was really uh, surprised at the number of gardeners who have a freeze dryer. As I regularly say, I think gardening and food preservation go hand in hand. They play very well together. You grow your own food and then you preserve it. And I know many of us are are using dehydrators and we're canning and we're pickling uh, and freeze drying for me is new. I'm just so excited that so many of you already have a freeze dryer and are already doing it because it is one of those things that it's it's one of the best ways to preserve your your harvest and your food in general. And and so to do it along with gardening and for, for so many of you to be ahead of me, I think that's fantastic. And and then of course a lot of the others. Um, there you go. Gail has a freeze dryer but haven't used it yet. So uh, good for you. And uh, uh, the Redhead Co has resisted the freeze dryer. Um, but yeah, it, it takes planning, it takes preparation, it takes budgeting. Uh, but I think it is one of those things I'm, I, I have little doubt I'm going to fall in love with it because uh, the, based on the comments and, and the videos that I've been watching, those who have a freeze dryer just absolutely love it and you freeze dry everything. So I'm looking forward to making some videos about that because it's going to be fun. Mitchell, my wife has tasked me with starting a garden and your four by eight raised bed videos were a great help for next year. Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. This is actually a great time of year. I, I, I don't wait for my first frost date to do major gardening activities like that, but it plays into the general time of year. When that first frost date is approaching and I'm starting to clean up the garden or I'm accepting that the garden's about done, I start looking to next year and and building new beds, amending the soil in the beds I have. And so this is a great time of year to start thinking about next year. And I'm glad your wife tasked you with that because uh, getting the beds started early and then getting them filled and getting the soil alive, you'll be ready to go next year and actually start growing some of the plants. And, and of course, definitely um, check out the videos I have on that whole process when you actually get into it. So there you go, Jay. There's the freeze dryer video that that came out uh, last week. So appreciate you doing that. So, uh, so before I forget, I did want to talk about a little bit more about uh, this is my garden picture I took this morning. And so it kind of ties in with that concept of building beds, amending the soil, those activities that I do when the first frost date is approaching. And that's to document the garden. My garden only looks like this for a couple months out of the year. My, my season is so short. And for so many of us, we have a great year, or even if it's not a great year, we have plants that we want to remember. And we just get so busy doing all of the other things that we're doing that we forget to document what our garden looks like. And so that's why I wanted to take this picture at the very end of summer here as the season is about to change so that I can remember what my garden looked like on September 19th. Because there have been so many years over the decades where that frost hits and then kills all these peppers and the cucumbers and the tomatoes and all these squash plants. You can see some of the squash growing there. You can see some of the tomatoes growing there. You can see the pumpkins growing here. The frost hits and kills all those plants. And I never took a picture to document how wonderful the garden looked. So get out today and take a picture of your garden so that at least you know at the end of summer what it looked like and take pictures of the, the areas that you're proud of and that you want to remember. And that's why I thought I would show this picture today. Now, of course, I also wanted to show that I've got all these hoops in place because that's part of what the major discussion was today. Put the hoops in place before you need to put a cover on them so that if you have that, that change that's going to happen overnight and you're not ready, well, the hoops are already in place. I've got pre-cut plastic sheets in my shed. All I have to do is grab the plastic, throw it over the hoops, clip it into place using the spring clamps I have, 
and now I've got that extra protection overnight for these these plants. So so I use the first frost date in autumn and the last frost date in spring as action points in my garden to do things like the soil amending and the, the documenting and and especially at the end of the season that the end is coming get out your garden journal and make notes of what was good what was bad what you're going to do differently what you're going to do the same and if you do it now when it's fresh in your mind it really helps out for the planning that you're going to be doing over the winter and then starting again in the spring and so in the spring if it's spring right now or almost spring for you same idea hopefully you did that last year pull out those notes and start figuring out your planning for what you're going to be doing in your garden as your summer approaches while the rest of us are thinking about the winter that is coming soon so let's see redhead co says i'm this close to going with the metal beds thanks for your videos my only question is how the perennials such as asparagus will do as the metal provides less insulation in the wood so the nice thing about asparagus is it it freezes solid in winter my asparagus beds that are back over here my soil freezes uh, officially my frost line i think is 32 inches deep in this area of colorado so my soil freezes down to 32 inches and the asparagus is about 12 to 15 inches deep so my asparagus freezes solid every winter and comes back every winter so it really doesn't matter if it's in a metal bed or a wooden bed or a stone bed or just in the ground it's going to freeze if your winters get that cold and i wouldn't worry that much about uh the the metal beds i'm growing uh horseradish in metal beds same thing those beds freeze solid horseradish comes back like gangbusters every year so if the plant is used to those kind of cold temperatures it really doesn't matter what kind of bed you use uh, and as far as whether it's going to kill the plant or be too cold for the plant the plants can handle it that's just what they do they they handle the freezing conditions the same with my herbs i've got uh mint in in a metal bed this is one of the best mint years i've ever had and just shrugged it off a lot of herbs will do well in metal beds as well so uh, don't be worried so much about the insulation because it's going to freeze on the other side because it's it it doesn't have the thick insulation you might think of as wood it tends to thaw out a little bit faster in the springtime and so while horseradish can actually handle some cold and will continue to grow in cold conditions especially in the spring it's one of the very first plants that's growing in my garden because that small metal bed is is warming up and thawing out faster than most of the beds in my garden um, so yeah i wouldn't let that be the reason to stop you from from getting a metal bed <clears throat> and do click on the um the link i have in those videos for a discount uh if you decide to go with those metal beds and i mean you can grow anything you're growing in a wooden bed you can grow in a metal bed uh, i wouldn't think I wouldn't worry about the insulation. I did a video a couple years ago where I measured the temperatures and I actually did it again this year. <clears throat> I think I mentioned it in one of my videos. Um, I didn't do the video that I had planned, but I forget which video it is. I show the temperature differences and the soil temperature is no different in a metal bed than a wooden bed, than a, a stone bed. The soil temperature is the same. So I think it's a bit of a a misconception we have that the the materials we make our beds out of will provide extra insulation one way or the other it, it really isn't the case <clears throat> okay let's see um urban chicken mama wants metal beds next they are they are nice they look good and mine are actually working really well my the tomatoes i have in my my metal beds are doing really good uh, mine are wooden and giant root pouches and homemade uh, uh, re purposed things so yeah consider the metal beds uh, they'll they'll last for as long as you're gardening and uh, I've used a lot of repurposed stuff but I really like my metal beds you can 
you can see the uh, the one metal bed back here. I didn't grow anything in it this year uh, because I put it up a little bit late, but I'll definitely be growing in it next year. Um, and so Nadine's wondering, can you overwinter herbs in wooden beds? Oh yeah, absolutely. You can overwinter in any bed. So, so as you look at my videos, um, some of the videos I point out some of my herb beds. I've got uh, I've got some herbs um, that chives, for instance, that are growing in ceramic pots, and they overwinter in the ceramic pot. I've got the mint and other chives that are growing in metal beds. I have a whole bunch of herbs that are growing in wooden beds. I have thyme that is growing in my concrete block beds, in that little opening of the concrete block. I've got thyme that overwinters and comes back every year in that little opening. Um, and, and so, yeah, absolutely. There's, it, again, it really doesn't matter. The soil temperature is going to be pretty consistent regardless of what the material happens to be. And uh, I, I wouldn't be so concerned about whether it's uh, a wooden bed or a metal bed or a stone bed for the herbs. If it's a hardy herb that can handle the freezing conditions, if that's what you have, they're going to come back as long as you you uh, do consider watering occasionally. That's the one thing for those of us who have very cold regions. If we don't get snow, the soil can dry out at a critical time for the plants. The roots can desiccate and kill the plants. So often people think it's the container they're growing in that kills their plant, whereas more likely by growing in a container, it's probably going to dry out faster than an in-ground bed. And if you don't add supplemental water occasionally during the winter, the plant's just going to die out and or going to dry out and die as a result of it. So um, do think about adding water over the course of winter because it is something you should uh, stay on top of. If the temperature rises above uh, 40 degrees during the daytime, about four and a half Celsius, then you should probably think about watering if you haven't had snow and rain uh, until springtime comes. So, okay, let's see what else we have. Um, Jake Link was saying I had some mint that overwintered in a small pot. It's hard to kill. Absolutely, yeah, those hardy herbs, many of them are very hard to kill. And so they're just going to keep coming back every year. Rachel has oregano that's come back every or four or three years in a plastic Easter basket. There you go. Um, if the plant is hardy, it really doesn't matter what container you put it in because a lot of them really are hard to hard to kill. Hi, Sunset Farm, Ohio. Checking in late. Don't worry about checking in late. You can always catch up with what we've been talking about uh, our time here. Watch it. Watch it in a replay or just scroll back and start over again. But thanks for checking in. I appreciate that. Um, so the the other the, the other thing I wanted to talk about when we we talk about our frost dates in particular is that the frost date that is published is the official frost date from like the National Weather Service in the United States based on the historical data, but it's it's regional. And so it may be what you see and it might not be what you see. It's a guideline. And that's that's the, the finishing. That's why I wanted to talk about this as we finish up this part of the discussion. It's just a guideline. I encourage that you take your own temperature readings in your garden and put them in your journal so that you can see the patterns that develop. So I know that my garden tends to be four to five degrees colder than the city of Colorado Springs. So if the forecast for Colorado Springs is showing a frost for my garden, it might actually be closer to a hard freeze because of that four degree Fahrenheit variance. And recognizing that difference will affect the kind of protection you use on your plants and the kind of activities you do. Now, on my weather app on my phone, it's pretty accurate. I have one for my neighborhood, but it's often off by one or two degrees based on my own 
measurements. Your garden is unique and your weather is unique in your garden. And that's really the part that when you, if you want to take your gardening to another level, is to track your own numbers and then compare them to the official weather service numbers. And that'll give you that extra advantage, knowing that maybe you're two degrees warmer or two degrees colder on average. That will buy you a couple extra days in either direction, depending on how you want to approach it. So if you're not doing your, your weather monitoring, do it. And if you're not doing your temperature uh, analytics, do it. And I'm, I'm planning a video probably here in another month or two where I'll show you how to set up a weather station in your garden so that you can start taking some of these measurements to include precipitation. Because just because you get rain doesn't mean that that's enough water for your plants. So I think that you, know, you start putting all this stuff together. You start putting in the, the gardening knowledge with the food preservation knowledge, with meteorological knowledge. And that's how experienced gardeners have such great success. Is over the years, we start putting all of these pieces together at, with the knowledge that we've gained. And that's why it's so easy to garden when you're older. Well, it's because of all the hard lessons we learned along the way, but you gotta set yourself up to learn some of those lessons. And the weather definitely plays into it and is one of those things that I highly recommend that you consider uh, if, if you really want to take advantage of what you can do to protect your garden. Nick from Yuma, hi, Gardener Scott. Good afternoon, back at you. I made two pallet composts with covers. Are you pro covering your compost piles? It depends. So in my region, it's so dry that the piles dry out very quickly. And so I'm pro covering the piles in areas that are very, very dry, like the, the Southwest in the United States. It's so hot, so dry, covering your piles, giving them a little bit of shade, cutting down on some of that evaporation, is a really good idea. If you're in a very rainy area, you get the opposite problem. Your piles can get too wet, saturated to the point that the bacteria shut down. Covering the pile is a great idea in those situations as well. For most gardeners in most climates, it's not necessary. And so, so I'm pro if it works for you if you are making hot compost and turning the plow regularly, covering it can help keep the heat up during some of those periods where the pile is naturally going to cool down. So in general, a covered pile really does have advantages. The disadvantage is you gotta take the cover off if you're gonna turn it, or you gotta take the cover off to add to it. And honestly, that's a big reason why I don't keep my pile covered all the time. Because if I know I'm going to be adding to it, or if I know I'm going to be turning to turning it, it's just an extra step, so I don't cover it. But in general, I would say I'm pro covering uh, piles, especially in Yuma, Arizona. That's one of those things that, that uh, you can keep your pile moister and not have it dry out by, by putting a cover on it. So... Heidi's wondering, if my zone is in the west side of the USA and the same zone is in the east, how are they different? Or how are they the same since they're the same zone? Good question. And so um, I've talked about this before, and I've got a couple of videos, actually, where I talk about um, zones. And so all a hardiness zone is, is a, a depiction on a map of your coldest average winter temperature and so has nothing to do with snowfall or rainfall or how much sun you get or how long your growing season is it's purely the coldest temperature that's measured by the weather service and historically put into a database and the average lowest temperature determines what your hardiness zone is. And so there are a, a number of places, particularly United States, on the west side and the east side that have the same hardiness zone, and they're totally different. 
There, uh, Seattle, Washington, for instance, which is a far northern state, gets uh, a lot of 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 uh, nighttime in the winter and a lot of daytime in the summer. Tends to be very wet. That hardiness zone is the same hardiness zone as some areas of Florida on the complete opposite side of the United States. Completely different weather patterns, completely different amounts of sunlight in the winter and the summer, but it's the same hardiness zone because of their lowest winter temperature. Because Seattle's right on the coast and gets that, that, that effect of the, the ocean breezes, and it doesn't get freezing, freezing cold in Seattle. Neither does Florida. And so that's why you'll see the same hardiness zone with completely different climates. Climate is a completely different factor. And those are two totally different factors than the last frost date and the first frost date. And so I'm in zone 5B and my average last frost in spring is May 18th and my average First frost in autumn is October 5th. That's for the greater Colorado Springs area, not necessarily my specific garden. There are many of you who are also in zone 5B that have completely different first frost and last frost dates. So they're just guidelines for a general area. And to, you know, to your question, Heidi, uh, if, if your zone is the same as another zone 3,000 miles away, it could be completely different climate and completely different weather. It's purely a, his, a historical temperature reading that determines what the, the zone happens to be. And because it's, a, it's like a rolling window, they'll take 30 years of measurements and they update it. And so periodically, the USDA that, that does that in the United States has updated the map. And so the, many of us are in zones now, and we weren't in that same zone 20 years ago before they updated the, the most recent map. So it's historical and it will change over time. And that's another thing to definitely be aware of. So. Uh, so another reason I wanted to, to show you my garden in the picture today, and, and I, I talk about this often, but not only do you take a picture of your garden when it's at its peak and when it's looking good, but for many of us, this is a great time of year to make those notes of those wonderful things that are happening. And, and I, I've often talked about those firsts in the garden, you know, the first tomato, the first harvest, the first hummingbird, the first everything that, that happens that, that makes a difference to us. And it's the, one of the reasons why we garden. And one of the reasons why I garden is so that I can grow black crim tomatoes because I love black crim tomatoes. This week I harvested and thoroughly enjoyed my first black crim tomato. Now, the, the sad thing is I'm probably only two weeks away from my first frost date that's going to kill all my black crim tomatoes. But some of you may remember, I've said this before, if I can harvest a single black crim tomato and eat it, then it's a successful garden season for me. That's, that's at the top of my list. And it happened this week. So my garden has done better this year than it has in, in many years past. And I've had some wonderful harvests, but it's a success because this last week I enjoyed a black crim tomato. Now I've enjoyed the sun golds. I've enjoyed the sweet 100 cherry tomatoes. I've enjoyed my squashes. I've enjoyed the peppers. I've enjoyed everything that I've harvested this year, but nothing is like that first black crim tomato for me in my garden. And so I wanted to share that with you today because I hope there's something that, that you can also identify. It's taken all season. Some of you, you know, e Eli from the In the Garden with Eli and Kate, they're already cleaning up their garden in Scotland because their season is starting to come to an end. And so a lot of the plants that I'm just now starting to harvest, they're done with their harvest. It's already starting to fade. So 
So that's one reason why this is such a big deal for me, because so much of the world is way in front of me. I'm just now getting to it, but I'm getting to it, and it's wonderful. And I've got three more black grim tomatoes on my counter that I'm planning on enjoying today in a sandwich. It's just such a wonderful, wonderful fruit. And, and uh, I'm not sure if I saw Frank on or not, but today I'm going to be harvesting my first black cherry, cherry tomato. And I haven't eaten it yet. I haven't tried it, but they're just now coming in in my garden and I'm looking forward to it. And I'm sure Frank and all of you who, who suggested that I grow black cherry this year have already been enjoying your black cherries. But this is another highlight moment for me is black cherry tomatoes. I've never tasted one before. And today is the day. And I'm planning on filming it and releasing it as a short tomorrow. So, so look for that real quick. I'm expecting good things. And even if it's not a good thing, I tried something new, I reached the point of harvest, and now I'm eating it, and that's another success. So look for the successes in your garden and make a big deal about it. Because the season is, is ending for many of us, and all we're going to have is that memory. Unless, of course, you do the preservation and you can save some of these harvests into the future. But when they're fresh off the plant, it's hard to beat, and that's why you need to remember it. That's why you need to make a big deal about it, and that's why I'm sharing some of my big deals with you because I'm really excited about it. Thank you, Greg, for that super chat. Have a great week, everyone, and I hope you have a great week as well. Greg, this is going to be, uh, I think, for all of us, as good a week as it can be, and hopefully it's a great week, and I'm looking forward to all of these harvests knowing that it's the end that's approaching and that I'm not going to have these harvests again for an entire year. So I'm making the best of it. I'm highlighting those key moments, those things I really like. And I'm, I just love this time of year because it's got so many of these, these moments that can carry me forward into next year. So great to see everybody here today. So nice to have you as part of my Monday, and I'm glad that I can be part of your Monday. And I look forward to seeing you, you here again next Monday as we do this all over again. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.